This show is brought to you by the Garden Gurus and Evergreen Garden Care. Evergreen Garden Care and their market-leading brands are some of the most trusted consumer brands within the garden care market. They produce high-quality garden care products designed to help people create their own green oasis. Whether it's a garden, a balcony or potted indoor plants, they want to inspire anyone, anywhere to be able to easily create and maintain their own garden. To find out more about Evergreen Garden Care, head to www.lovethegarden.com. Garden Express are Australia's leading mail order gardening service, offering a wide range of quality garden products. Each week on the Garden Gurus Live, the team at Garden Express will share a weekly offer. So make sure after today's show, you jump online and visit their website. Hello and welcome to the Garden Gurus Live. I'm Darren Senor and I'm very happy to be filling in for Trev on this Monday morning. We have a wonderful show for you today. Here's what's coming up. Now is the time to be thinking about your spring flowering bulbs, the ones you want in your garden this spring. David Van Berkel from Garden Express will join us to discuss their brand new catalogue and some, some fantastic flower gifts. Are you too scared to transplant your precious plants? Well, Greg Nabor will join us to show us how to transplant your plants safely. Get your gardening questions in and remember to hit the like button. We have prizes to give away. Post your questions in the comments for your chance to win. Make sure you remember to let us know what state and city you're in as well. Up for the question. So Catherine from Mandra who sent me in a photo of her lawn and she's tried everything to get this lawn looking good but to no avail. Her partner waters, applies fertilizers and sea salt and top, top dresses regularly. He's tried aerating, then wetter soil, beetle sprays, all the appropriate pesticides, but the patches seem to heal and move elsewhere, which is why they sus suspected some sort of beetle. And she wants to know if I can help. Well, Catherine, what I think your problem is actually an issue with water, not getting into your lawn evenly. So what you really need to do is, is to get yourself some catch cups, which are readily available for most retail shops, put them around your lawn, run your sprinklers and just see if the water is getting around the lawn evenly. When you've done that, also dig up any of the areas that are dry and patchy. Have a look at the soil profile, see if it is dry or whether the water is getting into it or not. I think you'd need to have some work done on your irrigation system and possibly apply some compost and clay to the soil to try and improve your soil profile. This might take a, a few weeks or even a couple of months to get your lawn looking good, but it'll be a long-term solution. Albert in East Cannington, also in WA, had planted some azaleas in early summer in a backyard strip that's under the shade of his roof and a fence. It receives about two hours of afternoon sun. He's planted them in a mix of soil, sand and bentonite clay and has added some wetting agent. So currently one has died and the others are showing similar problems. All the leaves look burnt. He's sprayed with a milk solution and baking soda just in case it's a fungal problem. Could this be that they're planted too near the tin fence, Albert asks, or because of a soil acidity problem, as they're also near a limestone border? Well, Albert, I think it's actually a combination of a couple of things you've got going on there. One, the two hours of afternoon sun are probably too much for the azaleas. The afternoon sun, particularly in Cannington, is the hottest sun of the day. So they really need to be in afternoon shade. Being next to limestone border would be increasing the um, alkalinity of the soil, pushing that pH up, which azaleas don't like. So I'd be thinking of lifting the azaleas that are still alive, still kicking along, and moving somewhere where they get a bit of afternoon shade and into some soil that's a little bit acidic. Jonathan in South Australia wants to know, what's the best time to roll out some lawn? Well, Jonathan, I like to roll out my turf in my landscape reviews pretty much any time of the year but avoiding the middle of winter where the lawn just seems to take a long time to set new roots down and get growing. Uh, we have a lot of success rolling lawn out in spring, summer and autumn. The hotter the weather though, the more water you need to apply. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, remember too, to really improve your soil below the lawn so it gives it the best chance of building a strong and healthy root system. Lynn, who didn't put a city or state down, has two teddy bear magnolias on an apartment balcony facing southwest and they've been affected, infected by mealybugs since last October. I want to know how to kill these bugs so they don't come back. 
Well, Lynn, millipug is a bit of a troublesome one. So there's a, quite a few um, systemic insecticides that you can use that are registered for millipug, but they will take a couple of applications to um, clear the whole infection up and hopefully prevent them from coming back. The other thing too is mealybugs do seem to attack plants that aren't otherwise healthy. So make sure your uh, tea bag magnolias are being kept well watered and well fed. So that makes them more resilient and you tend to see less pest problems. Tyson in Victoria wants some advice on planting broccoli. Well Tyson, now is not the ideal plant time for planting broccoli. Normally you'd be planting that in mid to late autumn for winter crops. Um, broccoli, like most vegetables, like nice rich soil and needs to be kept moist through the growing season. And when you plant your um, seedlings out, make sure you apply a liquid fertiliser such as power feed. Keith, another person who didn't put his name a uh, city down, is asking when's a good time to trim his lychee tree? Is the summer too hot or would you wait till it gets cooler? Well, it sort of depends a little bit, Keith, on where you live, but generally with uh, tropical trees like lychees, you don't want to be pruning them when you're coming into cold weather. They like the warm weather. So the best time I find to prune them is straight after fruiting. So that, and again, depending on where the tree is growing, is uh, late summer and autumn. So as soon as the fruit's finished or as you're um, harvesting some of the fruit, you can give it a trim up then. Just avoid pruning it when you're coming into winter and the colder weather because that could lead to some fungal and dieback issues on your lychee tree. Rebecca and Hilbert has any wants some tips for one of her roses which is not flowering properly. The buds are drying up and they're not opening well. Uh, well, Rebecca, you could possibly have some insect problems. We do have a lot of issues in WA at the moment, chili thrip and it's attacking roses and really knocking them around and destroying the flowering. So you need to have a look and see if there's any issues with that, any bugs or anything that's getting in and damaging the flower buds as they're forming. Um, weevils are another thing that gets into them. The other thing too that would be affecting them is if they're not, uh, you're not keeping the soil moisture nice and steady while they're trying to flower and keeping them well fed. Um, if they're looking particularly scrappy, I always like to just give them a, a decent prune, apply a wetting agent, some liquid fertiliser and set, let them come back and keep them um, healthy and you tend to have better flowering. But first thing I'll be doing is be looking for pests, any bugs or um, other sort of things that are getting into the roses and damaging them. So Sam in Cardinia in South Australia wants to know how to prepare soil for tomatoes had blossom rot end rot with the last lot. The blossom end rot is a sign of a lack of calcium. So as well as adding some organic materials, some really well composted um, animal manures or just general compost, you could add some dolomite lime to add that calcium to the soil. Um, tomatoes like a really rich soil, they a very hungry crop. Um, but the dolomite lime to add that calcium will be a good preventative for the blossom end drop. Mary in the Sunshine Coast has native frangipanis that won't flower. They just lose their very top leaves and rot. Um, also, her cannas bloom lovely, but has rusty looking leaves and would like some clues on what the problem can be. Well, the native frangipanis, I'm very surprised that you're getting uh, no flowers or uh, the tips are rotting. You might have some issues with the soil staying too wet and you're getting root rot which is um, showing itself up in the, the ends of the plants. They do flower on those tip, that tip growth so that would be why you're not getting flowers. If you've got fungal disease causing the, the tip rot then you obviously won't be getting any flowers. So you could be have need to look at maybe applying a systemic fungicide, something like anti-rot to the tree to try and prevent that rotting issue and just make sure the ground around your native frangipanis isn't staying too wet, you're not over watering it, particularly if you've got a uh, clay soil. Uh, as for the cannas, they bloom but you're getting rusty leaves, um, you probably are getting a, a fungal rust on the leaves. What I would do with those is wait till winter, cut them right down to ground level and then apply some fungicide then to try and clean up the rust. Then keep them well watered and well fed through summer and hopefully they'll just grow out of it. You may need to, in summer, apply another fungicide just to try and get on top of that rust. Sue, in Crookwell in New South Wales, needs to add a few small trees to screen some tanks. They need to be quite full, even on the lower areas. She was considering magnolia little gems, but was wondering if I have any other suggestions and what time of the year is the best to plant. The area mostly gets afternoon sun. Well, for screening plants, the uh, magnolia little gem is an excellent uh, choice. They're very dense and you can keep them well furnished with foliage almost to ground level. Also something like a lily pilly or a water housier would be a good, good option to go for. 
and um, uh, even some of the, uh, depending on what your soil is like, maybe a melaleuca if you want to go for the native type plants or a calistamin. All of those can be kept nice and dense and pruned to whatever height you need them to be. Caroline in Melbourne has a passion fruit which seems to be dying and the fruit aren't ripening. Is it best to pull it out and start again, she asks. Well, it sort of depends a little bit on uh, why the passion fruit's dying. So passion fruit are generally fairly hardy, as long as they're getting adequate moisture and being reasonably well fed. Um, if the plant is an older plant, if it's been in say six to seven years, maybe coming just to the end of its natural life and then you would be taking it out and replanting. When you replant, dig a nice deep and wide hole. Passion fruit do like a, a wide root run to really send their feeder roots out to take up as much mo moisture and nutrients as possible and really build the, the soil up with plenty of compost and, and well-rotted animal manures. So over the past couple of weeks, Trevor has mentioned that there have been many questions submitted during the live show asking how it's best to transplant or whether it's safe to do so at all. So to chat more about this, I'm joined by Greg Nabel from Evergreen. Good morning, Greg, how are you? I don't think we can hear Greg. No, we can't hear. Greg can just restart his link. I think it's because you might have headphones on. Can you hear me, Greg? He can hear us. We can't hear, we can't hear him. I think you're on mute, Greg. So, so Greg's, while we try and get Greg back, he was going to talk to us about some of the premium Osmico potting mix products and um, for developing strong root systems when you plant out or transplant some of your plants. Um, the Osmico range contains growth stimulants, um, slow release fertilizers and certified to meet all the Australian standards. Greg's on his side now, hope he hasn't fallen over. So we'll, we'll, while we're trying to sort Greg out, we'll um, go back onto some more Q and A's. Um, Kerry in Adelaide, she had uh, frangibatic cuttings in some soil outside in pots and was told to not water it until the leaves appear. We've had, she's had some rain and wants to know whether she should have to put them under cover to keep them dry. Well, Kerry, if you dry the cuttings out a little bit before you put them in the pots, a little bit of rain really won't hurt. Um, they will start forming roots, particularly at this time of the year while it's still warm reasonably quickly and as soon as those roots have formed they'll be able to take up the moisture and uh, make use of it and you won't have too many issues with rot. You don't want them getting too wet um, but a little bit of moisture won't hurt at all. Have we got you back Greg? Have we got you back Greg? I think the technology is getting the better of Greg at the moment so uh, if we want to keep going with a couple more questions. Yeah. So uh, Linda in Hobart wants to replant her gladiolas next year as they've been attacked by bugs this year and had no flowers, just yellow leaves, and she sprayed with whitehall. Um, the gladiolo, gladiolo bulbs should still be fine. Um, the, if they've got bugs attacking the foliage, that's not going to really damage the bulbs. As long as the bulbs are still nice and fat and looking healthy, I'd have no problems planting them out. Just make sure once they start growing, you start feeding them with bulb fertilizer and liquid fertilizer to really build that healthy growth up. Um, you may not get heaps of flowers this year because the bulbs weren't fed as they were growing last year. But once they've been in the ground for 12 months, the following year, you should get a, a really good floral display and something to look forward to. Gladys, Gladys are a beautiful um, bulbous plant to have in your garden. Joanne in Serpentine wants to know when's the best time to, pr to prune Gardenias. Well, gardenias are another warm climate plant. They love the warm weather. So they're flowering pretty much this time of the year for most of the varieties. As soon as the flowers start to go off and they're finishing, there's no more um, buds coming through. I like to prune them. You prune them by 25%, feed them up, make sure they've got a um, good bit of wetting agent around the root system and you'll find they'll come into new growth and get nice and bushy really quickly. Jeanette's in southeast Queensland and she has a question about hibiscus and wants to know the best time to prune. Hibiscus, again, another plant we like to prune in early spring because they flower on new growth in late summer and autumn. So you prune them just before the weather starts to warm up, give them a chance to um, heal the, the prune, the, the wounds up, fertilise them. As soon as you get some decent uh, hot to warm weather, they'll bloom away and you just keep them well fed and watered through the warm months. By the end of summer, you'll have plenty of flowers and they'll flower right through to autumn. 
Libby is asking, can you grow vegetables in worm castings alone or should you mix it with potty mix? If so, what percent? So one of the not so really problems, one of the things you need to take in consideration with worm castings is you don't know exactly what nutrients are, are in them and at what sort of percentage. So um, you do need to be a little bit more careful with them and probably err on the side of caution. And I do think it's much better to um, blend them into your garden soil or blend them into the potting mix if you're growing them in pots. And I would be using them at a ratio of sort of about 20% worm casting and then the rest soil or potting mix, just to make sure that worm castings aren't going to burn your seedlings when you first plant them in. Worm castings are an excellent source of nutrients for your garden and work particularly well with most vegetable crops. Sandra from the central coast of New South Wales wants to know, do we water indoor plants after putting the Scots pour and feed fertiliser on? You can give them a light water. What you don't want to do is overwater them and just rinse those that fertiliser and products through the pot, potting mix and out the bottom of the pots because then it's just a waste. So you can give them a light water and um, just not over, don't overdo it, which is pretty much a good general rule for things growing in pots anyhow. So, so we're good. We've got Greg back. Have we got you back, Greg? I hope so. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah, we thought we'd lost you there. So we were talking about transplanting plants and the safest way to do it. And we're particularly interested in the Osmocote Premium Potting Mix and Premium Plus Potting Mixes. As, as a really good product for, for aiding in successful transplanting and repotting of um, people's favourite plants because uh, I do know a lot of people get very nervous at transplanting and repotting their plants. Indeed, and um, Darren, we've, we've done a, a lot of research on um, how it's best done. There's a lot of ideas about placement of fertilisers with, with transplanting, and so that work was done actually with the grapevine Research Institute over in uh, Blenheim in New Zealand. And uh, that work showed clearly that the idea of putting fertilizers at the bottom of the hole is not the best way to go, that you should be looking to half fill the hole and then putting Osmocote around the top of that surface and then finish filling with something like the Osmocote uh, garden soil, which will allow obviously the watering to go through down to the root system. Uh, and what that's done is really uh, promoted the growth of new roots around the pot and helps uh, around the root ball <clears throat> and helps the plant to stabilize itself and become firm in the ground. Yes, because establishing that new root system is a really important part of transplanting the plants because once those roots get going, uh, obviously the plant can sustain itself much more successfully than if it's uh, struggling to put the root system out. Yeah, there was an old idea that putting phosphorus way down below the root uh, had the plant somehow or other know it was there and the roots would go deep to looking for the phosphorus, but that's entirely not, uh, not true. <laughs> so putting a good fertilizer around halfway up the root ball. And you know, if you're transplanting for, uh, something from one part of the garden to another part, it's important to prepare the plant that you're going to move by digging that hole or the, the trench around and creating that root ball a good month or two before you in, end up then wrenching it and moving it. And that gives the, the opportunity for those cut roots uh, higher in the, in the root ball to callus and become ready to put out new root. Yep, so a bit of planning and preparation never goes astray. Uh, in this case, absolutely. Uh, those, the roots have to callus or else you'll, you'll just have a whole lot of cut roots that potentially will, you know, the plant can, can, can die as a result of not being able to access uh, water or fertiliser. And, and water, uh, keeping the, the moisture up to the freshly transplanted plants after doing the job is obviously very important as well. Yeah, and that's why uh, what I like to do is to fill the first half of the root ball with, with the soil that's there put the osmocote around the root ball and then finish filling with a potting mix with the osmocote uh, garden soil or native, uh, whatever the uh, particular tree is that you're moving, and then to deep water and to deep water once a week instead of, you know, a cursory water uh, frequently. The same idea with lawns, etc. just a good water once a week is, uh, is better for the root system. Excellent. Well, hopefully that'll give our, um, our listeners 
uh, some really good ideas about how to keep their healthy plants even more healthy once they transplant them and, or repot them. And uh, using the, the Osmocote products is obviously the way to go. It is. It's um, the, the Osmocote products are a controlled release. So that means that there's a, a steady release of low levels of nutrient continuously, which is perfect for transplanting. Well, that's excellent, Greg. Thank you very much for your time this morning. I'm glad we were able to get the uh, technology sorted out. Finally there. Thanks, Darren. Good to speak to you. No problem. Thanks very much. So some great advice there from Greg. Um, back to the question. So we've got uh, Aussie, Aussie Greg is thinking about buying a fruit cellar tree. How long do the fruit trees normally take to fruit? Um, generally, you're looking about three to five years before you start getting good regular crops and um, substantial quantities of fruit on the plants. Uh, Phil wants to know how to propagate African blood lilies in New South Wales. Well, pretty sure African blood lilies are, are a bulb and that the bulbs can be lifted and divided in the cooler months and just replanted out and then they'll get growing. You obviously get the, the foliage and flowers and the bulbs will thicken up again and you can lift them and uh, thin them out and build up your numbers of plants that way. Um, We'd love to see what your garden looks like and what problems you and what the problem is from your location. So don't forget to send in your video questions. Two videos will be selected each week to be played on Garden Gurus Live, and Trevor or myself will answer them here for you. Videos will only be selected if they follow the following criteria: criteria, and that is applicants state their name, location, and question. And videos must be submitted through the FB page by Wednesday, the week before the live. We would love you to get involved. Please send us your video questions. Now onto some more questions from the page. So Trina, I hope I pronounced that correctly, from South Australia in Adelaide, has a Maya lemon tree and Trina sent in a picture and I've had a look at it and a Maya lemon tree is looking very sick and she says it's slowly dying. She's had it about 15 years and lemon trees should live a lot longer than that. And she's regularly looked after it, fertilizing it every three months and watering it often. This year is the first year they've had no flowers or fruit and she's sprayed with white oil. There are lots of ants on it and some scale, but she's been killing the scale by hand and spraying and has asked for some help. Well, Trina, having a look at your tree, it looks like it's actually suffering a bit from not getting enough water. So although you might be pl applying plenty of water, it doesn't look like it's soaking into the tree or into the soil around the tree so the tree can um, take that moisture up. And when it's not taking up the moisture, it's not taking up the fertilizer. That makes the plant very susceptible to things like scale and the fact that you have ants around the tree as well also indicates very dry soil. So that'd be the first thing I'd be looking at doing is having a look at the soil. Have a good scratch around the soil surface and see if the water that you're putting on is actually soaking into the ground and how deeply it's soaking in. Then I'd be looking at applying a wetting agent. The um, sea salt soil wetter is one I've found really effective, particularly works well around citrus and then some trace elements or rock minerals fertilizing the tree and then getting it well mulched. But it's really important that that moisture that you're applying to the tree is soaking in nice and deeply and really getting in around that root system. Hopefully then the tree will improve, you'll get some fresh growth and it'll be really healthy by fruit flowering and fruiting time next year. Good luck with that because it'd be a terrible shame to lose a 15 year old lemon tree. Lynn has do cyclam and flower now. She has two potted ones who are flowering now under trees and filtered light. Um, well, if yours are flowering, they obviously do flower now. Um, cyclamens do have a, a period where they're pretty much dormant, where if you have them in pots, you just leave them on their side and let them dry out during the year. And then they'll come up with some new growth and then they'll flower. But um, they flower at different times, depending on um, where you're growing them in Victoria. If they're flowering now, it must be the flowering time. I can't be too um, precise with that for you, sorry. Uh, Lynn in Victoria, oh, sorry, Tyson in Victoria. How can I grow grapevines in plant pots and give some tips and advice? So growing grapes in, is certainly possible in pots. You will need a, a quite a big container, a half size wine barrel would work pretty well. You need to use a premium grey potting mix. Um, so one with all the ticks on it keep it well watered and because it's in a pot and the fertilizer tends to leach through it really quickly if you use a granulated, granulated fertilizer, I'd recommend using a liquid fertilizer, something like PowerFeed and do it every month to sit every six weeks during the growing season, which is mid spring to the end of autumn. Um, you shouldn't have too much trouble other than that. And the one thing about the grapes is if it is in a pot, 
you can in winter pull some of that old potting mix out and refresh the potting mix and do that every three to five years and that should keep your grape growing really really well james in mahogany creek in wa wants to know what a good tap timer is for a polyrhetic line for a garden bed the one she's, he's used doesn't seem to be able to handle the water pressure when the tap is turned on and the tap is on standby and they leak um, I don't use a lot of tap timers. The one I use is the Hunter BTT, which is a Bluetooth tap timer. I found that to work really, really well. And I've actually used it at a couple of locations not far from Mahogany Creek and they've worked particularly well. If you are having pressure um, issues with pressure being too high, you can put a pressure reduction valve on the tap before the tap timer and that may help you with that problem as well. But tap timers are a lot of, like a lot of things in irrigation, you get what you pay for. The more expensive ones are generally higher quality, so you get a lot less the issues with things like leakage um, from the, the water pressure. Joanne in Serpentine has asked, I don't know what lawn I have or how to manage the lawn, as I'm sure I have several different varieties. Is there someone out there that will come to my home and give me guidance? She has over 2,000 square metres of lawn. Joanne, many of the um, lawn companies that are around that sell lawn do also have consultants that will go out and look at your lawn. Having several different varieties is not unusual. I hardly see a, a lawn that's been down for more than say five years that doesn't have at least two or three varieties in. Um, main thing with lawns is good soil and good water and regular light applications of fertilizer. But if you were to ring around a couple of the turf uh, growers and turf suppliers, they would definitely be able to put you, uh, give you a name of a consultant that would happily come out and have a look at your lawn. It's surprising sometimes how a couple of little things of the lawn, um, just applying a few different products, can get you much better results than what you're having. So good luck with that one. Uh, Michelle in Queensland is having a difficult time with mealybugs and root mealies. Can you give me some advice on saving my plants? She has lots of succulents, flowers, and also shrubs and veggies. Um, spoken about mealybugs once already, and they are a really um, painful pest to get into the plants because they do get into the, the root system and the soil profile around the plants. So trying to spray them and, and um, get them off your plants can be really difficult. Um, there are a couple of systemic insecticides that are recommended for mealybugs that are registered for mealybugs and they can be applied as a soil drench. So I'd have a look down at your local garden centre, ask for a mealybug appropriate systemic insecticide and one that you can apply as a soil drench so you can get the mealybugs that are also living in your soil because otherwise they'll just come out and infest your plants as well. Um, as I said, mealybugs are a really persistent problem and can drive people absolutely crazy. So now is the time to be thinking about what spring flowering bulbs you want to have in your garden. And Rowan from Garden Express has joined us today to help us help you get started. Rowan, good morning or good afternoon. Your time, how are you? G'day, Darren. Surprise, it's Dave, not Rowan. Oh, hi, Dave. I pushed him off to the side and I jumped into the seat. Oh, we're lucky to have you. So your spring catalogue is just about to come out or has come out? Uh, I think it dropped last week, mate. We'd, uh, we've, we've put one together. Again, after all the COVID experiences, we've managed to uh, uh, assemble, again, a fabulous collection of spring flowering bulbs for everyone. Well, I know a lot of people really look forward, forward to it. What's a, a couple of the, the ones you think um, will really get, get people excited? I think, again, this year, uh, hyacinths are going to be one of those um, beautiful bulbs that people are going to really want to get into. There's, there seems to be a bit of a shortage this last few years. Uh, we lock onto the stock early, make sure we're growing a, as best crop we can. It's a, it's a bit of a difficult crop to, um, you know, to raise up to get the good bulb size, but we've got some fabulous colours coming through. And, of course, the, the wonderful scent that they give off uh, is just an amazing plus for the garden. Yeah, they're always very popular for in the, the bowls on people's tables and think those sort of things are really um, you know, uh, exciting little plant to have growing in your garden. They're pretty easy to grow once they get going too. Oh, once, once you get them going for sure, you know, and, and one of those that just loves all aspects, you know, pots, gardens, rockeries, um, you know, it's just a beautiful, versatile uh, plant. But all the regulars, again, Darren, the uh, daffodils, tulips, uh, the, the grey pythons, the small little muscari ones, yep. loads of easy grow bulbs for first timers, uh, or just things that you can sort of throw and grow in your garden, and they'll come up under you know under your deciduous trees or along your fence lines. You know, um, bulbs just so adaptable. Yeah, they're they're a great little garden plant. They give you that such 
cheerful displays in spring for, for very little effort and then most of them will just persist in the garden and, and keep going year after year. So you guys have a, an amazing Australian Day offer, I believe. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, look, uh, it's probably three or four years now we've uh, we've put together something special for, for Australia Day in the uh, in the garden world and we've got a, a beautiful pack of, uh, of the spring flowering bulbs, 225 bulbs, for $29, that's a saving of 65 bucks. Well, that's uh, pretty impressive. 65%. 65%, yeah. So that, that's, that's pretty impressive. So that's, uh, give, for most people in the average size garden, um, 225 bulbs will go a long way. Go a long way to put in a, a, a nice display, you know, a little bit of that throw and grow stuff as well. Um, just a, a beautiful uh, selection that will give you probably two months of colour so they don't all come up at the same time. We've got a couple of varieties in there to just stretch out your flowering period. So you probably plant a couple of metres of garden bed out of that. Yeah, no, that sounds great. Any tips for the for the listeners for, you know, what they can do just to give themselves the best chance of getting a, an absolutely stunning display? Yeah, I guess the, the tip at this time of year would be not to plant too early. So we're just, uh, you know, a lot of the harvesting's happening at the moment. This is the selling period. Get your orders in, secure your your bulbs, but they'll be delivered throughout February and then hold them off until about April for planting is the best time. So right now, prepare your garden beds for where you want to plant them uh, and secure your stock. They're the two biggest tips we can give at the start of the summer, mate. Yep, so um, get your orders in and then get out in the garden, get the soil ready for them. Yeah, perfect. Perfect, mate. Excellent. No worries. Well, thank you very much for that. We really appreciate your time and I'm sure many of our listeners will be uh, very eager to get some of those fantastic bowls for a great spring display. Definitely. No worries. Well, Australia Day offer goes up. Uh, when's that, Rowan? It's up now. It's up now. Just just put it up for uh, for the viewers and we, uh, we look forward to a great year ahead. Thanks for your time, Darren. No problem. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so back to some more questions. Um, we have Jen in Perth. That has, her buffalo lawn is dying in the heat wave. What should I do? She wants to think about maybe giving up to autumn. Well, I wouldn't personally, if it was my lawn, I'd be trying to look at why it's um, struggling and dying in the heat wave because buffalo is a fairly resilient turf. It's really just a question of um, whether it's getting enough moisture into the root run and whether the soil profile is able to hold on to that moisture. So I'd look at a couple of the areas that are struggling particularly, maybe get a little hand shovel in there, have a dig around and see what's happening in the soil below the turf. Because if it's really dry and it's not holding any moisture, you've got other issues that you need to deal with. Generally, it's trying to get some organic material, maybe some clay into that soil profile, just so the soil can hold some moisture and encourage a really deep and extensive root system. When a buffalo lawn has a solid root system, it's far more resilient. Um, the other thing is irrigation, making sure your irrigation system works really th thoroughly and effectively. It's sending um, water evenly across your lawn area so you're not getting wet and dry patches. Um, check out those couple of things and try and get your lawn up and going while it's nice and warm because the hot weather will actually encourage strong growth as long as the, the lawn is getting enough water and sufficient fertiliser. So please remember to send in your questions and remember to state your name and your state and then hit the like button. Shay in Newcastle in New South Wales wants to know if there's any effective way of killing pennywort that's taken over a garden beds and into the lawn. Um, pennywort, like a lot of those sort of running ground covery type plants, can be controlled with glyphosate. It will take it out, but that can be a major issue in garden beds and in the lawn because it will obviously also take out your plants and your lawn if you're not really careful about where you apply it. The only real safe way to do it is on your hands and knees and dig it out and you need to get all the roots and runners because it reshoots very easily and it really just requires persistence over a long period of time to get rid of it out of the lawn and out of the garden beds where you can't spray it out. Um, can be a lot of work but you've got to get onto it because if you leave it any longer it'll just keep growing especially in this warm weather and you'll just have a much bigger problem. Glenn asked, on a recent garden gurus, Trevor spoke about a small mango that had shoots below the graft. He said to rub off the shoots and not cut them. Could you explain what the difference is? Cheers from Glenn on the Gold Coast. Well, Glenn, sometimes when you cut them with a nice neat cut, it actually encourages them to reshoot again. So you get more of the suckers and the problem can persist for a while, while longer. If you rub them off and it's a more nat natural sort of wound and the plant tends to callus over and you'll get less of the suckering happening. 
just need to keep on top of it, keep an eye on it and make sure those suckers don't get a chance to establish because the suckers on your root stocks are generally more vigorous than the top stock, which is a, the type of mango you want to grow for the fruit. And um, it can eventually overtake the plant and you end up with all root stock and no top stock. So secret there is just stay on top of it and make sure it, um, you don't get the, give the suffering suckers a chance to get away from you. James from Frio in WA wants to know, how do I rejuvenate the soil and how long does it need between crops? Um, depends what you're growing. If you're growing flowering plants and vegetables, you tend to rejuvenate the soil between every crop. So if you have a crop of veggies and you've they basically come to the end of their season, you pull them out, then you'll add some compost. Um, down in Freya, I'd definitely be adding some kale and clay as well. And uh, you do that between every crop, uh, a little bit about rough animal manure, some cow sheep manure, that sort of thing. But between every, every crop, just to give that soil a big boost because the uh, flowering plants, so your flowering annuals and your vegetables do use a lot of the nutrients up in the soil. So you're just replenishing the nutrients and keeping your soil really healthy because that looks after the soil mi microbes as well, which will look after your plants. Kate in Perth, her grass is drying, like most people's grass in Perth is drying and wants to know what re wetting agent I recommend. There's lots of really good wetting agents. Um, I've had a lot of success with the sea salt soil wetter. Um, it, you get that as a hose on applicator, so it's very, very easy to use. Um, and I'd be doing that every four to six weeks in Perth during the hottest time of the year, just to try and keep that soil nice and moist and, and look after your grass a little, little bit better. Matt in West Perth has a, a lovely heart hoya and it is growing very long stems. And I think you might want to know when to prune it and to try and keep it um, a bit more bushy and, and throwing out some more shoots. Uh, Hoyas do their best work, their best growing work during the warmer months. So pruning that while it's still warm it will get you um, reshooting and get the, the Hoya pushing up and getting more tendril so it doesn't just get long and lanky. Um, you, as an added bonus, Matt, if you're taking the the prunings at this time of the year, they do strike quite easily, so you can um, increase your plant numbers too of your Hoya. Jim and Freya wants to know what you should plant this weekend. So if you're planting um, vegetables or flowering plants, Jimmy, Jimmy, you could uh, plant cucumbers or anything like the tomatoes even. The cherry tomatoes still have plenty of time to get up and fruit. Uh, even some of the chilies will have enough time to get up and fruit. Uh, vinkers and petunias, still plenty of time to get them in, get them growing and get your flowers before the end of the um, end of the summer period. So uh, make sure you, uh, everyone hits the like button, stays engaged with the program, we really appreciate it. Robin will send a message out to our seed winners after today's show. Trevor will be back next Monday for another session of the Garden Gurus Live, 12 p.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time and 9 a.m. for WA viewers. Don't forget your video submissions via Facebook by this Wednesday. Two will be chosen for next week. Remember to state your name, state and suburb, and the question. Remember too, you can always jump on our website and catch up with our previous stories from The Garden Gurus at thegardengurus.tv or YouTube channel, thegardengurus.tv. You can listen back to today's live stream and catch up on previous episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Audible. Happy gardening, everyone. This show is brought to you by The Garden Gurus and Evergreen Garden Care. Evergreen Garden Care and their market-leading brands are some of the most trusted consumer brands within the garden care market. They produce high-quality garden care products designed to help people create their own green oasis. Whether it's a garden, a balcony or potted indoor plants, they want to inspire anyone, anywhere to be able to easily create and maintain their own garden. To find out more about Evergreen Garden Care, head to www.lovethegarden.com. Garden Express are Australia's leading mail-order gardening service, offering a wide range of quality garden products. Each week on the Garden Gurus Live, the team at Garden Express will share a weekly offer. So make sure after today's show, you jump online and visit their website.